Well, good evening from Gateway Church in Vic, it's Aperture. And we're going to start a song with a piece of no I think, called Bless the Lord, O My Soul by Matt Redman. But before we sing the uh, first of all, spoken prayer. Father, we thank you we can meet together tonight to hear your word and to pray. And we ask your hand to be upon us, Lord, and fill us all afresh with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we just feel that we're leaking vessels, Father, we need more of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we pray we might experience you afresh in our lives today, Lord, Lord tonight. So we just commit this time to you now and we pray your blessing upon our singing and upon the word of God as we hear Frankie speaking later on, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So bless the Lord on my soul.
God, you're the, you're the strong God, you're the big King, yeah. you're my song in my God. Thank you that you're a faithful God, we just worship you tonight, God. We thank you that you, you're with us, and you, you promised to be with us, Lord. We just kind of commit our time to you now, God, and pray. We bless Pope Francis, you said, share the word, in Jesus' name. <laughs> I feel very short. <laughs> really, really short. I'm going to be a nightmare because I'm probably going to step around a bit. I don't know the camera's on me. <laughs> well, good evening. I'm going to start with a question. Are you ready? I'm on. Are you ready? Yes. Do you know who's never ready? My children never ready. Sunday morning, I gave them my usual half an hour countdown. We're leaving for church in half an hour, guys. You know what you need, don't you? Yes, mummy. We're leaving for church in 15 minutes. Are you ready? Yes, mummy. We're leaving, going out the door. You're not ready. They're never ready. They have a different definition of being ready than I do. And you know what? The Bible has a bit of a different definition of being ready than we do. Being ready in the Bible is an expectation. In fact, it's a command. Revelation 19 verse 7 says, His bride, the redeemed, has prepared herself and made herself ready. It's not a one-time deal. It's an ongoing process. And no one else can make us ready. The bride makes herself ready. And if you guessed that I'm talking about being ready tonight, well done. In 2019, my focus for the year was be ready. And when God gave me that, I really didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what was going to come out of that. But I was really excited to see what the year would bring. And it was a little bit unexpected because actually everything that like I heard through the year and everything I saw just seemed to be about being ready. And it was really, well, you could tell it was God because it was just like popped up everywhere and like hit me in the face wherever I went. So tonight I just want to talk about really what it means to be ready and look at some examples from Acts about what being ready looks like and how God uses us when we're ready. So, living Bible ready, this is the definition of the Greek word to be ready. Prepared, standing by, ready to meet the opportunity or challenge at hand, ready because the necessary preparations are done. I like that, ready to meet the opportunity or the challenge at hand, because life with God can be pretty like a bit like a roller coaster really can't it <laughs> and things come into our lives and sometimes they're a challenge and God wants us to be ready all the time no matter what comes before us so what does he want us to be ready for I believe he wants us to be ready to be used by him to evangelize to preach the gospel to make disciples and to do good Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, 2 Timothy 4.2. In season and out of season, that tells me, Paul's looking for a really cool way to say all the time, and he doesn't just want to say all the time. In season and out of season, when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. Preach the word and be ready. Be ready to convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So if we are to preach the gospel and to convince and to rebuke and to teach, we kind of need to know what the word says. So we need to do some preparation ourselves. God expects us to be ready. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19. And to do good works, Ephesians 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Good works kind of covers a multitude of stuff, doesn't it? It can cover anything. If it's good, if it's God-directed, that's a good work. It's, it's a cover-all for so many things in God's kingdom. We are to be ready to walk those paths, those things that he's prepared for us to do before, and before we were even born. He's got things in mind for us to do. And I take great comfort from that because if it was left down to me, I probably wouldn't get much done. I do a lot of cleaning, but I wouldn't do a great deal else. I do a lot of organising behind the scenes, but I wouldn't really get anything practical done or useful because that's really not just my nature, you know, where I kind of do what I need to do and then kind of sit back. But God's prepared stuff for us, but he needs us to be ready to do those things. When Paul was recounting his Rome to Damascus experience towards the end of Acts in chapter 26, he said that God said this to him, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister or servant and a witness, both of the things you have seen and the things I will yet reveal to you. So God told Paul, you're going to be a servant, you're going to tell of the things that you've already witnessed, and you're going to learn some new stuff you don't know yet. And I find that really exciting. Things that I will yet reveal to you. Stuff we don't know we're going to tell people about. Stuff we don't know we're going to do. Yeah. I think that's exciting. Yeah. I think that's really exciting. Mm. So, we know what being ready is. And we know what we need to be ready for. How do we need to stay ready? My head's just moved a bit strange. What is that? <laughs> it's my camera. It's falling off. <laughs> I wore my hair up last time and it fell off. <laughs> Thanks. So, what, how do we stay ready? I think, well, I'll pick three foundational ways to stay ready for God. So I'm going to give you both sides of the coin. I'm going to tell you, we don't do this, but we do do that to make it really easy. Hebrews 12.1 says, let's lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And the word ensnares there is from the Greek. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but I remember looking it up and it means to encircle around. That sin that will just creep around us and before you know it, it's encircled us. The writer of Hebrews says, don't get caught up in that stuff. Run with endurance and don't let those things ensnare you. So don't engage in sin. Do obey the word. The flip side of not sinning is obeying the word. If we love God, we'll keep his commandments. And we must be ready to be corrected by him as well when we do uh, step out of line. Because we all do occasionally. He get, um, Hebrews 12, 15 says, Don't despise the chastening of the Lord, or be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. A father who loves their child will rebuke them. A father who loves their child will tell them when they've done wrong. And our Heavenly Father does that too. But he's ever so gentle about us, normally, unless we needs to... Hey, come on, I've told you before. Maybe just sometimes, maybe just for me, because I'm naughty sometimes. So don't sin, do obey the word. Don't conform to the world. Hebrews, not Hebrews, Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that's the flip side. Don't be conformed to the world, do renew our minds. So that looks like not thinking the way the world thinks. Because the ways of God are completely different to the ways of the world. They're just like flipped on their head. They're just completely opposite to each other. The world says one way, but God's way is completely different. So don't do things what the world says. Do what God says. Start thinking his way. We've got the mind of Christ. And sometimes I use the mind of a small gnat. I am really stupid sometimes. I make stupid decisions. I take the wrong road and I know what I should do. But I've got the mind of Christ. I should know better. And we should be using it. We have the mind of Christ. We should be renewing our mind in the Word of God and seeing things through the lens of the Bible. So don't engage in sin. Do obey the Word. Don't be conformed to the world. Do renew your mind. Don't give the enemy a foothold. I think this is a really important one because. 
We can give the enemy a foothold when we don't really know we're doing so. Ephesians 4 is a really practical chapter on living really well. And in verse 25, Paul says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour. When angry, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. There's a number of things that we can do in our lives that really we just, we just start stepping a little bit further away from the things of God. And actually what we're doing is we're stepping a little bit further away into giving the devil a foothold. And the things that come out of our mouth, if you read Proverbs, it talks a lot about what comes out of the mouth. It talks a lot about speech. And one of those things that will give the devil a foothold is the things that come out of our mouth. Don't lie. Don't sin when you're angry. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. Do give yourself wholly to God. Mm -hmm. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, brethren. He's talking to the Roman church. He's saying, I'm begging you guys, listen to this. By the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. What does that mean? That means submitting to God, being close to him, obeying the word, wanting to do what's right in the sight of God over what we feel, over what we think, over with what everybody else is doing, with that one little fish going against the tide. Submit yourself to God. And, now, and when we do that as well, the devil will flee from us as well. Submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from, flee from us. So this is Lessons from Acts, so it would be remiss of me not to talk about Acts. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples of people who were ready when God wanted to use them and how much of a blessing it is to be ready when God calls upon us. Now, I was a bit spoilt for choice because Acts is full of people who were full of the Holy Spirit and who were just doing amazing things in the, in the early church. So I started off in chapter 6 and as we start in chapter 6 we see the church and we see that it's been living in this amazing way in this really close fellowship with each other where they didn't even class their possessions as their own they just shared them between them there was one accord there was unity there was proper fellowship i tried to think of a word instead of saying doing life together because i don't like that phrase and i've come up with they communityed so we're going to get this trending and we're going to make it a word and it's going to end up in the oxford english dictionary if it isn't already there they communityed together they were a proper community of believers. And we start in chapter 6 where the Hellenists, um, who were Jews who were like Greek speaking, um, they felt that their widows weren't being taken care of when there, was a when there was daily distribution, presumably of food and things like that. And a little dispute arose, but it was handled really well because it got to the disciples, the apostles, they didn't go and complain and murmur and give a foothold to the devil and let the mouth run away with them. And the apostles decided to let the, um, the body of believers choose seven men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom to take on this role. And this was kind of the, the birth of deacons. And we, we meet Stephen and we meet Philip and some other names that I can't name and Nicholas. And the poor ones in the middle just get made up names by me because I can't pronounce them. There's one called Parmesan in my when I read him. I can't tell what it says. <laughs> but we get these guys and they're full of the Holy Spirit and they're full of wisdom and they do amazing things. Stephen is so full of the Holy Spirit. He's in with the people. He's in and you think, oh, he's just serving tables. But no, he's preaching the gospel and the signs and wonders are following and the scribes and the Sadducees get to hear of it and they try and argue with him and they've got no argument for him because he's so full of wisdom. And they end up, because they can't beat him, we'll kill him. And obviously we know Stephen gets martyred. But out of that, we meet Philip. And I call him Faithful Philip, because he had an amazing adventure with God. He'd been living his life for God. He'd been chosen as one of these seven. He'd waited on the tables, he'd served. And he gets this fantastic opportunity which we're going to talk about in a minute. But he'd been faithful in a little, and then God was said, right, let's do the next thing. Are you ready? And he was. 
So by the time we meet Philip, persecution has scattered the believers from Jerusalem after Stephen's uh, stoning, and only the apostles were in Jerusalem. So Philip, we he appears in chapter 8, um, and verse 5 says, He went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. But unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralysed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. Not the street, not the church, not the town, the city. There was great joy in the city because the word was being preached, because Philip had been faithful with a little, and he was ready to be used by God for the next thing. He'd gone preaching in Samaria, so uh, he just brought the gospel, and signs and wonders, wonders followed. He's faithful, he's ready. And in verse 26, he gets to go on an amazing special mission by God. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So I looked on a map, and Jerusalem to Gaza is about 50 odd miles as the crow flies, and this journey is along a desert road. Okay, it's wasteland, apparently, that road was. So he's sent, and he's just told, go. He doesn't know where he's going, he doesn't know what it's what for. He arose and went. He's ready for the next thing God's got for him. No questions, just goes. And behold, a man of the Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, and the Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So he'd been to Jerusalem to worship, and he was on his way home to Ethiopia. And he was reading the scroll of Isaiah. So he was a guy who was seeking. He was seeking God. He'd been to Jerusalem to worship, and he was reading the scriptures. He was reading Isaiah. He's ready. Little did he know he was going to have this amazing encounter, this divine appointment. But remember, he's a guy of influence. He's under the queen. He's a treasurer. He'll be in a nice chariot. He won't be in a little shack, he'll be in a lovely chariot, and he gets this amazing opportunity. The Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip has to go and overtake the chariot. Fine if you're in the chariot. But Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? Philip ran to him. I had to look the word up in the Greek when I read this to see what it says, and it's prostreco, run like an athlete, like Billy Wiz. Every time I read it, I just see Billy Wiz's legs going, because this guy's in a chariot on a desert road, an ideal place for thieves and robbers. These roads were perfect for robbers and thieves and, and bandits, basically, because they're just wasteland. So this chariot, I can't imagine it going slow. It should really be going at a fair speed because you don't want to stay in the wasteland. You don't want to stay in the desert, do you? That's my thinking. That's not, there's nothing in the Bible that tells me that, but that's my logical thinking when I read it. Philip ran and overtook a chariot. And he said, how can I understand, because Philip had asked him, do you understand what you're reading, unless somebody guides me. And Philip came up to sit with him. Then Philip opened his mouth and, beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Philip didn't even know where he was going. He ends up in the chariot of this guy under the queen, this ruler, you know, a guy who's high up in Ethiopia, and starts preaching to him. And they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's the water, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and baptized him. Remember, this is a desert road, and they've just found water. They came up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. So the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now we can read over that and just think, okay. But Philip was caught away. If you had a Latin Bible it would say rapturo, where we get our word rapture from. He was hapazo in the Greek, hapazo, catch away, seize, 
He was raptured out of there. Just like that. He was instructed by an angel. He was possibly physically, supernaturally physically endowed to run really fast. He preached the word. He baptised a guy in the desert. He, he was instructed by the Spirit. And then out of there he went. And he was found as a Zotus, which is also called Ashdod. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. This guy had the most underrated spiritual experience ever. He was just like there and then he wasn't. I mean, what the unit must have thought, who knew? But he was ready. He was faithful in a little and he was entrusted with more and he was ready to step into whatever God wanted for him. We can only imagine how it must have felt for him suddenly to be in the desert and the next minute to be over up in Ashdod miles and miles and miles away. But when we continue into chapter 9, we see more people being ready, more people experiencing God's supernatural, um, uh, amazing uh, blessings when we let him work through us. So Philip, we don't really hear much from him. He continues his work, presumably, preaching the gospel. But in chapter 9, we come to Saul, who we know as Paul. Now Saul had been introduced previously at Stephen's stoning, and he was consenting to the stoning. And in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and he asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He wanted to go to Damascus to arrest the Christians. And so he went to the high priest and said, give me some letters so that I can go to Damascus and I can, you know, legitimately arrest these people because it's come from the high priest. Saul's first letters were to bind the church, which is very ironic, really, given that he's famous for his letters to the church, telling us all about Jesus. But he says... Any of, of, of the way, let me, let me arrest them. I love how he calls it the way. It's not a religion. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not just something we do. It's who we are. It's what we walk. It's the way. It's a way of life. And he journeyed and he came near to Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now Saul thought he was persecuting the church. And if we receive persecution, we think we're being persecuted. But actually, we're not. It's Jesus who's being persecuted. We're being persecuted because we represent Jesus here on the earth. Because we are his. We are one with him. Jesus says, if you're persecuting the church, you're persecuting me. So we should never take persecution personally. People are persecuting Jesus. We are his representatives here on earth. So trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise, go to the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And here we're going to see that God's a God of order and preparation. He's prepared this divine appointment for, for Saul. Saul isn't going to arrive with no one to take care of him and wondering what's going to happen next. God has put everything in place and we're going to see that God needs somebody who's ready to fulfil the next part of his plan for Saul. So the men journeyed with him, stood speechless and heard the voice but saw no one. And Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened he saw no one. He was three days without sight and neither ate or drank. So God took away Saul's physical sight to give him much needed spiritual sight and there was a certain disciple at Damascus called Ananias and to him the Lord said in a vision Ananias and he said here I am Lord and I love that here I am Lord I'm ready I'm willing I'm listening I'm ready to hear from you so obviously the the gospel's gone out to Damascus Saul's on his way there to arrest all the Christians there so there's already a church there, there's already believers there. This guy, Ananias, clearly, I believe, he's got a very good relationship with the Lord. 
And we'll see that through his, uh, through his conversation with the Lord. But, so the Lord spoke to Ananias in a vision, and he said, here I am. And the Lord said to him, arise, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, behold, he's praying. God gives this guy really specific instructions compared with Philip, who was just told, go, go on the road to Gaza, I'll tell you when you're there. God gives this, this man really specific instructions. You go in to the street called Straight, you go into the house of Judas, you're going to find Saul of Tarsus, and he's going to be praying. So Saul was doing the right thing. He was praying and fasting. So in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. So at the same time that God's speaking to Ananias, God's also told Saul, you're going to have a guy called Ananias come and lay hands on you and pray for you. You're going to receive your sight. So Ananias has a lot riding on him here. He's got to be ready. He's got to be willing and he's got to be able because God's already told Saul. So God's got this all prepared. Ananias has got this vision giving him clear instructions to where he's going and what he's going to be doing and who will be meeting. And Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So Ananias doesn't say, gosh, no, Lord, it's inconvenient. This guy might arrest me. This guy might turn on me. It might be a trap. Lord, no way, I'm not doing it. No, I've got too many responsibilities. I can't do it. He simply says, look, he's come to arrest the saints. You do know that, don't you, God? And this is why I think he's got a really good relationship with God, because he can ask the question. Because God doesn't mind us asking questions. Gideon was a big question asker. Lord, can I just pour out a fleece? Can I just do it again? Are you really sure it's me you want it to use, Lord? I'd be like that. I totally, millions and millions of fleeces. God, please, just tell me again. You know, he doesn't mind us asking questions. Ananias had a heart, though, for God, because God said to him, he is chosen, go. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name. So Ananias knew that this man was chosen by God, as God's just told him, and that he's going to be prolific in the Gentile world and the kingdom of Israel, and he's going to suffer. And God said he would tell Saul that too. So Saul did not go into his life for Christ blindly. He knew what was coming, because God said so. So Ananias went his way, entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me, that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Ananias goes. He lives ready because he puts God, God's plans above his own. He doesn't make excuses. He doesn't back away. No, Lord, it's too risky. I just don't go, Lord. He just goes. He's a faithful servant of God. He was ready to hear from the Lord. He was obedient. And he filled Paul with the Holy Spirit. And he gave Paul sight back. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. He arose and was baptized. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. And Saul spent some days with the disciples of Damascus. So this guy not only got to pray for Saul, fill him with the Holy Spirit, give him his sight back, but then he got to share the gospel and foundations of the faith with him because Saul stayed there and spent some time with them and immediately Saul preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the son of God so the change in Saul was like that he just went from zealous for God for the Jewish faith to zealous for Jesus Christ and what a blessing Ananias must have had all his life seeing the life of Saul as he as he went around planting all these churches, and, and Paul said on Sunday that obviously quite a lot of time elapses through Acts. It spans quite a life, a, a long time. But you know, if Ananias saw all that and saw what Saul had become, I mean, we never know who the next person we evangelize to. They could be the next Billy Graham. They could sure. be the next. You know what I mean? We just don't know what God's got in store for people, do we? We just have to be faithful and ready. Um, 
Um, if we go into chapter 10 really, really quickly, we see Cornelius, who's a centurion, and he's a devout man who fears God. He's praying, but he's not a Jew. He's a Roman, he's not a Jewish guy, but he respects God, and he gives generously to the people, and he sees a vision. He's ready because he's praying, and he does it a lot. Clearly, this is something he does often. He prays regularly. And he put himself in a position to hear from God. And God said to him, Cornelius, I love how God calls up people's names. Saul, Martha, Samuel, Cornelius. Cornelius had a lifestyle of giving and of prayer. And he put, made himself ready. Even though he wasn't a Jew, he made himself ready to hear from God. And in chapter 10, Verse 5 um, said, uh, Your prayers and your alms have come up for memorial before God. Send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter, whose lodging was Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. So he sent to Joppa. So he hears from God. And again, God's working behind the scenes because Peter was up on the household praying. And he'd had this vision of this big sheet and all these unclean animals. And he heard a voice saying, kill and eat. And Peter was like, no, we don't do that, Lord. We can't, never, never, never touched anything, Lord. Never, never eaten that. Um, but he heard this three times and then the, the vision disappeared. And as he, as he, that vision, he came out of that vision, he heard the spirit speak to him and say, behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, go down, go with them. Doubt nothing, I sent them. So he gave Cornelius quite strict and, and precise instructions. You go in here to this person's house to find this man. His house is here by the sea, where he just says to Peter, don't doubt, just go. Sometimes he doesn't give as many instructions. Sometimes he doesn't give as much information. Sometimes that's probably good, because if Peter heard that he was going to a Gentile's house, straight then, he might have thought, oh gosh, no, I'm not sure about that. Sometimes God keeps things from us because we mess things up a little bit. So what if Peter hadn't been praying that day and he hadn't had that vision? What if he hadn't made himself ready? Remember, the bride makes herself ready. Yes. We do certain things, we prepare ourselves, we make ourselves ready. If Peter hadn't prayed that day and those people had come asking for him, even if he'd gone with them, he wouldn't have been prepared because he wouldn't have had the vision. He'd had the vision because he was praying, because he was faithful, and he was doing things that he knew he needed to do to stay prepared and ready. He had the vision in readiness for what was coming next. Peter went down to the men who had been sent from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? So Peter, through this, doesn't actually know a lot about what's happening. He just knows some guys are coming, and the Holy Spirit says, Don't doubt, just go with them. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man who fears God has, and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in, they lodged, and on the next day he went with them. And some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So Peter does what the Holy Spirit says. He goes with these guys to meet Cornelius. He knows he's had a, a message from God, and he knows he's got to talk to them. But as far as we're aware from the writings in Acts, Peter doesn't know anything else. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy it's a little bit later, he's been, he's got to Cornelius' house, sorry, and he's told them a little bit about, about Jesus and about what's happened. Um, and Cornelius had gathered all his friends and family. He was an expectant guy. He was ready for something to happen. He'd heard from God, and God said, go get this man, he's going to tell you something. He was ready. He brought everyone. All his friends and family had come over. And Peter had been talking to him. And verse 44, while Peter was still speaking the words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. And this is the beginning of the opening of the gospel to the Gentiles, which, thank God, happened because... Yeah. We are those people. Um, Peter answered, uh, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And Peter answered, 
anyone forbid water that they should not be baptized but receive the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so they got baptized. Mm -hmm. So, God has things in place. He has divine good works that we should walk in, plans that he's prepared ahead of time, but we have to prepare ourselves for those yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he'll tell us a lot, sometimes he'll just say, just go. And we just have to be ready to go. Mm -hmm. Doing the things that we always do, being faithful in a little, like um, Philip was just faithful doing what he was doing. He was full of the Holy Spirit, he was full of wisdom. He got to be a deacon, he got to serve the people, and he went out and he got a whole city full of great joy because signs and wonders had followed the word that they preached there. And then he was taking on that amazing mission for God because he was ready. Amazing. There's one other thing that the Bible says we need to be really ready for, and that is his appearing. Matthew 24, verse 44, Jesus says, Therefore, you who follow me must also be ready. So, if you follow Jesus, he's speaking to you. You must also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus says, if you're a follower of mine, you've got to be ready for when I'm coming. You've got to be ready for his appearing. appearing. Why? Because he goes on to tell a little parable about ten virgins. Five were foolish, five were wise. They all started ready. They all had oil in their lamps. They all had lamps that were lit. But five didn't stay ready. Readiness is not just a one-time deal, as I said at the beginning. It is a, it's a lifelong thing. It's a daily thing. Ready every day. Staying ready. Five stayed ready. Five made sure that they were ready when the bridegroom was coming. Five didn't. Five thought ready was a one-time thing and they, they could just get ready at the last minute. Just like my children did, they could get ready at the last minute. And you know what? Sometimes when my kids take ages to get ready and I'm standing at the door and I'm ready to leave the house and they're like, oh, mommy, we haven't got our binoculars and oh, we haven't got this and oh, I want to take a notebook and I want to take 15 cars with me, mommy. And they go and fill up their bags. By the time they come back to the door and they're ready, I started something else. And I'm not ready then. <laughs> I don't stay ready. <laughs> and that's a little bit like these five foolish, foolish virgins. They were ready, but then they didn't stay ready. And we can be a bit like that if we're not careful. Because being ready is continual. God never tells us to be stagnant. He never tells us just to stand still apart from sometimes if he's telling us to stand in fight of the faith and stand still and let him work, but we're still moving forward. We're still doing things for him. We're still sowing seeds, even when we're waiting on the Lord. When we're waiting or standing in faith, when we're waiting for the unseen to become the seen, we're still doing something. We're still standing in faith. We're still sowing the word. We're still growing. We're still bearing fruit. We're still making disciples. We're still growing in our relationship with God. We're always moving a little bit more forward. We're not just standing still being stagnant. We're always making ourselves ready. He told the five virgins who weren't ready, I don't know you. And uh, I find them verses really, really difficult. And I'm not, I'm not going to pretend I don't. And I think most... Christians who read them find them very difficult because they make us reflect. He said to them, I don't know you. But if we're living ready and we're loving God and we're, we're living a life for him, then he won't say that to us. Because we are ready, we'll be the five wise virgins. We'll have our lamps full. We'll be ready to do those amazing things that God's planned beforehand. So, living ready looks like Obeying God and it brings tremendous blessing. Obeying Him, not being tangled up in sin, renewing our minds, not being conformed to the world, submitting to God, not giving an enemy to the foothold, but to the foothold, foothold to the devil, being ready for His appearing. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. 
we thank you that you've given us instructions that we can follow because Lord if it was if you hadn't given us guidance and if you hadn't given us some instructions I'd be floundering but Lord I thank you for your grace Lord I thank you that Lord that you would take the time with us when we are not quite there sometimes when we miss it sometimes Lord when you've asked us to do something and we haven't done it Lord you do give us grace and you do forgive us Lord we thank you that you're faithful and just to forgive us when we confess our sins to you but Lord we thank you that you do have a plan and a purpose for us and we thank you that you have got good things for us to do and I find those things so exciting Lord and I'm sure all of us here want to walk in those things that you have for us Lord show us how to be ready for you Lord, G is along when we're, when we're lagging behind a bit. Prompt us when we're not quite there, Lord. We're ready and we're listening, Lord. And we just want to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.